I am Alessandra Venturini, the holder of the Jean Monnet Chair in European Migration Studies, financed by the European Commission, based at the University of Torino. I'm very glad today to open the fourth lecture of the second edition of the seminar Cocumint, Consumption of Cultural Goods as Driver of Migrant Integration. The seminar is interdisciplinary with contribution by economists, anthropologists, social scientists, linguists, demographers, and by an artist who is very involved in social inclusion. Last year we had Michelangelo Pistoletto, and this year we had Marinella Sernatore, who is an amazing young artist. Today we are very happy and honored that Peggy Levitt and Kang, Kang Zan Lee accepted to be with us. Peggy Levitt is a chair and professor of sociology at the Wesley College and associate at the Harvard University Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. She also co-founder of the Global D Center. Her book, Artifact Ali Giants, How Museum Put the Nation and the World in, on Display, is the point of reference for academics and practitioners, professionals. It was based on many case studies and also the one that Peggy did in Italy. She also came to Torino. And it evaluates uh, how museums are adapting to the new global environment, uh, who is marked by rapid immigration and social changes. She looks at cultural inequality and what we can do by studying how artists and writers from cultural and peripheral country get recognized on the global stage. He published with Vivian Sieber, who lectured for us last year and today is with us, the, the article uh, Scale Shifting New Insight into the Global Literary Circulation for the journal World Literature. She also wrote, moreover, Mona Lisa, moreover, Jane Eyre, disrupting the culture intellectual inequality pipeline. She also wrote for the Juno International Cultural Policies with Anna Trionda Filidou, Jeremy Molo, and Nicholas Dines on cultural policies and cultural politics in the Global South City. For economy, she has a, a special role. She, uh, she holds a special place because she elaborates the concept of social remittances, which has spanned a structured and important research area for economists. And yesterday, Ilera Poport presented a strong empirical test of it. Kang San Li is instead professor at the New York University, but in Abu Dhabi and um, he is a sociologist and market analyst. His research and teaching interests include economic sociology, organization, sociology of culture and art, entrepreneurship, social network, and creative industries. His current, current research tried to bridge big data and social science to analyze markets, including conventional financial market, but especially art market. We are all looking forward to see the presentation and to understand this mix. Peggy and Kangasan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And Alessandra, thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to share our work um, to such a, a multidisciplinary audience. I really applaud your efforts to bring such an interesting group of thinkers together. So Kang Sang and I are going to tag team today um, and we'll see how that works because that's the first time I've tried to do this on Zoom. But um, So Kang Sang, can you uh, change to the first slide, please? Okay. So who is Walid Rod and which countries claim him as their own? Born in Beirut, Rod left Lebanon during its civil war to study in the United States. He's lived there ever since. The exhibition materials for his 2015 show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York describe him 
as a leading contemporary artist, as leading contemporary artist Walid Rod. We're told that his work is informed by his upbringing in Lebanon during the Civil War and by the socioeconomic and military policies that have shaped the Middle East in the past few decades. For an exhibition at the Moderna Musset in Sweden, he created multiple short autobiographies, both serious and tongue in cheek. Several linked his works to Middle Eastern, North African and European traditions, including events like the 1915 locust attacks in Syria and the 1930 publication of Walter Benjamin's on some motifs in Baudelaire. In this way, he positions himself as an artist who belongs everywhere and nowhere. He resists geographic and ideological labels, although they continuously pursue him. Rod is among many artists who migrate to study or work abroad, um, nor is he alone in having his national and regional identities being important tools for gaining recognition in and out of, outside his birthplace. In fact, in the past, many artists from the global south moved for some period to traditional centers of cultural power, such as New York, Paris, or London, to get recognized in the global art world. This is true, for example, of Nanjun Paik, one of the first and most famous Korean artists. And it's also true for Marta Manukin, who was who was um, is well known outside of her country of origin before she was recognized within it. She was born in Buenos Aires in 1943, but now divides her time between Buenos Aires and New York. So next slide, please. We argue that these early movers laid down the paths through which the art made by later generations travel. At first, these roots are strongly influenced by, uh, strongly influenced by former colonial ties, but later expand beyond their historical trajectories in regionally different ways. In fact, the expansion of the global art world over the last 25 years is such that at least some prominent Global South artists no longer have to migrate in order for their work to circulate. These new art makers and managers are decentering the global art world, not just by increasing the number of cultural nodes around which it takes shape, but by bypassing its traditional centers of power and challenging its rules and metrics of success. Next slide, please. Oh, no, I think I think I'm too far ahead. So go back to that. one. Thank you. In this talk, we track the different trajectories of cultural globalization by comparing the relationship between artists, physical migration and the circulation of their works. We do this by looking not just at the circulation of cultural objects, but at how culture shapes movement. Globalization is itself a cultural act shaped by the horizon of affect and meaning. Previous research categorized cultural globalization as a one-way diffusion of norms from center to periphery, primarily controlled by gatekeepers from the global north. We find instead that many of the regional artists in our study traverse a wider range of routes to arrive at a more diverse set of destinations, which change over time. We focus on artists from three countries, um, Argentina, Lebanon, and South Korea, over the past 20 years. We choose these cases because they differ with respect to their temporal and spatial integration into the global cultural field and because they each claim several contemporary artists with international profiles. Our quantitative and qualitative analysis of the career trajectories of, of artists reveal the important role that mobility for study, work, or settling abroad plays in the initial stages of gaining international attention. We also highlight the role that vernacularizers and in particular co-ethnic diasporic actors play in catalyzing and broadening artistic circulation. Finally, we find that labels first used to describe artists which drive forward their initial circulation can constrain the circulation of their work at a later stage. We suggest four types of labels, aesthetic, ethnic or identity, geographic and ideological. By that we mean when an exhibition or a work is termed post-colonial, therefore signifying an ideological stance. These categories create clear conditions that only some artists can fulfill, but also keep them tied to particular 
character, uh, categories, even when they later went on, want to break out of them. Through these three factors, our work raises important questions about the extent to which the decentered alternative routes and destinations this, this circulation creates can maintain their autonomy and independence in the face of the overwhelming power of the cultural mainstream. So let me talk a little bit about the theoretical frames that we're, um, that we're uh, referring to. Research on cultural globalization looks at the cross-border circulation of a variety of goods. Um, scholars argue that these works are more likely to travel because they address a set of recognizable central themes and because they're produced, managed, and consumed in ways not tied to geography or particular cultural contexts. Much of this research depicts one-way flows of norms and practices from what are now understood to be multiple centers to multiple peripheries and sees Western cultural producers as more powerful than their non-Western cultural culture, sees Western cultural producers as more powerful than their non-Western cultural consumers. It's clear, however, that new cultural nodes and routes often connecting destinations within the global South to places such as Beijing, Sao Paulo, and Sharjah are on the rise and challenge the status quo. Despite this, a more equitable distribution of fame and fortune remains elusive. The global art market is still dominated by artists in the global north and numbers of artists from Asia, Africa, and Latin America who manage to break through are still a small predictable group. So we, we suggest three important factors that nuance our understanding of cultural decentering. First, as the role of migration or how the place where artists move to study and work affect how and where their art circulates. In each of our cases, some members of the earlier generation of artists who became known outside their country of origin did so by moving to more, more prominent cultural capital. So did some did by choice, while others were forced to into exile by political or economic circumstances. Second, we look at the role of vernacularizers. These individuals go beyond simple transmission and translation to make something comprehensible, appropriate, and useful as it travels from one context to another. They don't communicate merely to be understood, but to make something relevant and applicable. We argue that at least two types of vernacularizers are important in the decentering of art worlds. The first are members of a transnational academic and cultural class or the gatekeepers of the global art and academic worlds. While many of these individuals are products of the global north, increasing numbers while born in the global south study, work, and live outside it. A second particularly important subset of transnational professionals are part of the national diaspora. There are the ethnic national scholars, art critics, and curators who now live and work outside their countries of origin, but still, still maintain strong personal and professional attachments to it, or are open to overtures on the part of sending governments to do so. These individuals and the social networks they create strongly affect the breadth and depth of circulation. Our third contribution to a more nuanced understanding of cultural decentering is to understand how it's driven forward by processes of labeling. We analyze how the work, the ways in which labels arise, change, are strategically deployed and are endowed with different meanings, affect migrants, uh, affect artists migration and the subsequent migration of their works. Studying the labels used in contemporary art exhibitions of new artists from emerging regions reveal how audiences are being helped to come to terms with new cultural artifacts in a globalizing world. Often curators and galleries group apparently different cultural objects together based on the nationality of their creators. By doing so, they structure and order a rapidly changing art world that is in the process of integrating new regions and into which new regions seek to be integrated. Because these cognitive frames facilitate the emergence and legitimation of new forms of art, these kinds of exhibitions institutionalize new product categories. They also change, strong, strongly shape the possibilities for the future integration of artists from the same region into the global art world. We use these data along with our qualitative analysis to analyze the longitudinal changes and circulatory patterns 
for artists and each country across different periods, age groups, and exhibition labels. Our comparison brings to light in the global ex in the global light changes in the global exhibition networks that these artists belong to and the underlying structural developments that drive these changes forward. So now let me say a little bit about our two cases and we're going to start with Lebanon and then go on to um, to South Korea. Long before the Lebanese Civil War, the territory that would become independent Lebanon produced several artists who were well known to the world and well traveled within it. Daoud Korm, for example, spent time in Belgium after King Leopold II commissioned him to paint the royal family. Later, Paul Gregosian, one of Lebanon's most well-respected well artists in the late 1900s, studied and worked in Paris after first passing through Italy. During the Civil War, many of the artists who would be later become known as the post-war generation fled the country, settling primarily in the U.S., France, and Germany to work and study. After the war, several factors propelled by actors in and outside the country laid the foundations for Beirut's thriving post-war art scene. For one thing, international NGOs and foundations like the Ford Foundation and the Prince Klaus Foundation funded artistic and cultural activities to fortify peace and democracy. The post-war generation coalesced around organizations like the Beirut Art Center and the Arab Image Foundation, which were founded with international support. This gave rise to a fertile period of creativity and innovation. Many members of the group experimented with videos and installations. They thought deeply about what story to tell about Lebanon's contested history and about the appropriate materials with which to tell it. They mounted the Elul Festival, which took place between 1997 and 2001, which featured new art, performance, and films from around the world. They founded Ashkalawan, a nonprofit organization which went on to become a leader among alternative art institutions throughout the Global South. These individuals and the institutions they work from are change agents and vernacularizers. They were born to challenge and disrupt at the same time that they insert work from Lebanon and the surrounding region more, more centrally into the global art world. The labels post-war generation um, critical or alternative that they deploy are ideological. They signal to fellow travelers a commitment to reorder and expand the boundaries of the geography at stake and to use art practices and institutions as instruments of change. By creating networks of artistic and cultural exchange, particularly within and between the Global South, archiving regional cultural production and nurturing emerging artists, they locate themselves centrally in the global art world in order to fundamentally challenge it. An important early vernacularizer and laborer was Fry Lason, who, who together with Guido Mine founded the Kunsten Festival des Arts in Brussels, Brussels in 1994. She traveled widely and arrived ready to listen, recalled one now prominent artist in the post-war group. She was the one who told me, he said, that what I was doing was performance. <clears throat> she labeled my work more in terms of a genre before she called me an Arab. He knew, he said, he was doing performance, but he did not know that there was a performance circuit he could be part of or that there were so many other artists experimenting in this way. Layson labeled and made legible both for the artists themselves and, the, and for the potential consumers of their work by bringing several emerging artists from Beirut to participate in her programming in Brussels, she began charting the pathways through which their work would travel. It also marked the beginning of post-war Lemonese artists being known for video, creating performances and installations, and interrogating history by making and collecting the ephemera from which it could be told and archived. A second key vernacularizer was Catherine David, a French art historian, curator, and the current deputy of the National Museum of Modern Art at the Centre Pompidou in Paris. She directed Contemporary Arab Representations, a multi-year, multi-sided project that was one of the first major attempts at presenting contemporary art and other types of cultural production from Arab countries within both a Western and Arab context. The exhibition opened in 2002 in Barcelona 
and later traveled to Rotterdam. It featured photography, film, and research-based work by many of the artists who became the country's most prominent artists today, including Walid Raad, with whom we began. The label Arab captures the simultaneous enabling and constraining power of such markers. While it brought a whole new generation of artists to the world's attention, it can also constrain their ability to change and grow. Ayman Balbaki is an example. He's best known for his large paintings of warriors wearing veils or what appear to be Palestinian head, head wraps. His work has been shown in many international exhibitions, but as a geo gallerist Salah Barakat, who represents Balbaki, said he has trouble gaining traction in New York. This is because Barakat believes the Palestinian Israeli conflict influences what makes it into galleries and collections in Manhattan. Balbaki's work circulated because he took on these subjects and was labeled accordingly, but these labels also limited the place to which his work has subsequently traveled. During the initial stages of Lebanon's insertion in, in the global art world, migration, vernacularization, and labeling all work to jump to, to jumpstart its decentering. Artists moved to France, Germany, and the United States, where they create social networks and introduce new publics to art from the region, which later extend to new cultural hubs. These diasporic vernacularizers got a boost from their transnational counterparts, who not only presented work to European audiences, but labeled it in ways that made it legible and comprehensible. This early circulation to Europe and the United States using labels associated with the Middle East and Arabness direct the world's attention to regions that would later become cultural hubs of their own. Now let me turn to uh, South Korea briefly before turning it over to Kang Seng. The heightened presence of Korean cultural production on the global stage did not begin until 1988 when newly democratic Korea, whose economic fortunes were also on the rise, opened up fully to the world by hosting the Olympics in Seoul. Before that, Koreans rarely had passports or traveled abroad. A small number of artists studied abroad, such as Nam Joon Paik, who went to Germany, and Park Sabo, who went to Japan. It was the rising prominence of the Korean wave, or the Hallyu, said Literature and Translation Institute director of the English language program, Boon Hun Ya Yoon, that set the country's sights outside of its borders. From the Korean wave, he said, we have gained confidence and we're not, that we're not just a small country on the far side of Asia, but that we can compete on the world stage. Aspirations for international fame in the art world grew with the meteoric ascent of what became known as Don Sequa art. In the mid-1960s, a group of artists interested in struggles over national identity, belonging, and tradition began creating monochromatic work that ultimately took this name. Most work valiantly, most work valiantly, but in relative obscurity with occasional shows in Asia until the early 2000s when a perfect storm took shape. The new global focus of the art world with its sights on emerging markets such as in Asia previously brought previously under-recognized artists and movements like Don Sequa into the spotlight. Professor Joan Key is a critical vernacularizer, working from the diaspora in this story. Professor Key's book, Contemporary Korean Art, Don Sequa and the Urgency of Method, the, was the first English language account of this movement and made a compelling case for distinguishing Korean monochrome art from similar works made in Japan. Two major shows in Seoul, one in Seoul and one in Los Angeles that were curated by Professor Key received a great deal of attention. And as a result, several institutions brought Don Sequa works, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the, Center, the Pompidou Center in Paris, and the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Collectors took their cues from these international tastemakers and the prices for Don Sequa works skyrocketed. I've never seen, said prominent art advisor Alan Schwartzman, this amount of widening interest in a particular circle of non-contemporary artists in historical material before. It was a no-holds-barred effort to create a national cultural product that would be clearly distinguished from its Japanese and Chinese counterparts. 
While many of the most prominent contemporary Korean artists, including Hege Young and Doho Sa, do not work in the Dante Kwa tradition, this aesthetic label brought attention to a geographic one. The art world became interested in all things Korean, and Korean cultural producers were more than willing to create accordingly. State and private companies and foundations all play a role in advancing the national cause. As the country became known for K-pop and television dramas, the government put in place an extensive set of strategies to promote Korean culture abroad. It often does so through public private partnerships with Korean corporations and with help from diasporic vernacularizers. For example, Anika Yi is Korean born who's one of Korea's also most famous artists, is Korean born, but now lives and works in New York City. So Kyung Lee, who is the head of the Transnational Research Center at the Tate Modern Museum, lives and works in London. Joan Key, the professor, was educated and teaches in the United States. The Tina Kim Gallery in New York is owned by the daughter of the gallery that had the first Don Sequa exhibition in Seoul. And because holding an international graduate degree is an unofficial requirement to get hired at a Korean university, there's a generation of primarily US trained scholars who are now writing art history and curating exhibitions from in and outside the country. Even if these individuals are not predisposed to the cause, they're often attracted by the money and resources the Korean government makes available to support it. These infrastructures dump, jumpstart and lend momentum to artistic circulation. Hagi Young's career is a good example. She left Korea for Berlin in 1994 and now splits her time between Germany and Korea. Early on, she was forced to take a break from art making to support herself. By the time she got back to work, she said she felt like the whole world had forgotten me. Her first post break exhibition was in Amsterdam when she said an unexpected miracle happened. Bina Chow, a Korean born woman who graduated from De Apple, an exhibition space and curatorial studies program in Amsterdam, saw her work and liked it. According to Yang, at that time, there was a group of Korean born curators who were just starting out, but they were working in isolation and didn't know each one another. Choi was among them recently employed at the Casco Art Institute in Utrecht. When an opportunity unexpectedly opened up for Choi to curate her own exhibition because her boss went on maternity leave, she offered Yang a solo exhibition. That show changed everything. Yang recalled in the first of many Freeze articles where she's featured in which Influential curators are asked to identify the most exciting emerging artists in 2008. Curator Joao Ribas described discovering the deft combination of conceptual rigor and formal, formal brilliance, the twain rarely meet, it seems, in the work of Berlin-based artist Hege Yang. Doors began opening. She met people who later invited her to be part of the Korean Pavilion in Venice to exhibit her work at the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis and who would be go, go on to become one of the chief curators at the new M Plus Museum in Hong Kong. At the same time, Korean born curators began returning regularly to Korea once the Gwangju Biennial started in 2010. Thus began the rise of an international and national market for Korean art fomented by art makers and art managers living in, the, in, living in and outside the country. In the Korean case then, just to sum up before I hand it over, widespread migration among cultural creators and managers is fairly recent. It coincides with a systematic national push to globalize and to export Korean culture in the same way the country previously exported computers and cars. Early diasporic vernacularizers use two key labels, one aesthetic, Dan Sequa, and the other identity geographic, or the Korean wave, to put Korean cultural production on the world map and to clearly distinguish it from its regional competitors, China and Japan. Their remarkable success gets a big boost from the Korean government and Korean corporations, which underwrite exhibitions, research, and scholarly conferences to use cultural power in conjunction with political and economic power to reposition Korea more strategically on the world stage. Now I'm going to turn it over to King Feng. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, thank you for the lovely the front half of the explanations about our paper. So the Peggy explained 
with uh, qualitative findings and those examples about those Korean cases and Lebanese cases, how migrations and vernacularizations and those labeling process actually works to introduce those uh, local artists in global art scenes and how that actually followed by those different artists who happen to be represented in the global art scene. In these sections, we tr try to find those findings by these migrators and vernacularizers and labelers to evaluate it, how our quality findings are actually reflected in more larger scale quantitative analysis of the global art rules. So we analyze each artist group exhibition records over time to examine how the global circulations, uh, circulations uh, change across time by age of artist and by period. So this is kind of like criminal pictures about those artists that we are actually dealing with. The number of the group exhibitions by years for Argentinians and Lebanon and South Koreans. So as you can see, all these three groups of artists started to receive the more attention from 21st centuries after 2000s. And overall, they had the group exhibitions across the world more than three to five times per artist per year. If we actually look at a little bit of the different pictures, how those exhibitions are actually located across those global regions, we can actually see, yes, they are still mainly focused on those Europe and North America, but if you're actually looking at those, the third largest, longest bar in each cases, you can see that the number of the exhibition in the surrounding region. So for Argentinian artists, yes, they have more of the exhibitions in Latin America, for Lebanese artists, we having more exhibitions in MENA, which is the Middle East and uh, North America, uh, North Africa, and Korean for Asia. And then, if you're actually looking at these figures and showing that the first hour sample show that the general patterns of the larger sample. So, these are like the most exhibited countries. For example, like Argentinians, they had an exhibit in the US mostly in Argentina and Spain and France and Germany. And for Lebanese, still the US, France, Germany and UK and Lebanon. And then for Korea, still the US, South Korea, Germany, France and Japan. So, so far we are just trying to show our sample is actually showing that the general patterns of the larger group of artists in general, we didn't actually pick the very unique cases so we had like uh, among like those top 30 to 35 very famous artists from these each nationality groups. And then it actually shows pretty kind of the general patterns even across the other artists from the same countries. Then we're gonna show uh, the more detailed paths behind these overall paths across the different periods and age groups. As we mentioned, the importance of the former colonial destinations decline as the number of the new locations to which artwork travel increase. The locations of the group exhibitions changes between older artists, which we call the born before the 1950s, and then the younger artists born after the 1970s. So for uh, these Argentinian cases, the Spain takes a back sit to France and the US and Italy and Germany and Argentina. So, as you can see, those like older generations, the Spain used to be the number third. And then here, the Spain is kind of the back off to like a sixth most common among those younger generations. And then the Argentina, the domestic exhibition became more dominant for those younger generations. When we are looking at the Korean cases, the Germany, the US, and UK, and Netherlands became the most important site of the exhibitions. While for younger generation, the Japan retreats almost 14 years. So for all the generations, Japan was on the force. And then for the younger generation, you can actually see all the way to the 14, uh, sorry, the 17th. And then for Lebanon, the countries that were ori originally import, important remain. So 
in that case is the France, Lebanon, US, UK, Germany, exactly the same for those younger generation too, the Lebanon and US, France and UK and Germany. But uh, over time, the Lebanon itself, along with the US, become very more important than the France. So they are actually paying more attention about their own countries rather than those colonial uh, regions that they pay more attention in the past. So in addition to the how frequently our artists are sh you know, shown in each locations for their, their guru exhibitions, we also investigated how the trajectories of the circulation change over time using the network visualizations of exhibition paths. So here, as you can see, yes, their exhibitions paths are quite global, and then they're actually moving quite a lot across those global reasons. But if you're actually looking at across different age groups and across different periods, you can actually understand how those decentralization is actually happening uh, using the, uh, by looking at this degree exhibition data. And then also we can understand how it is actually well matched the story with the Peggy already illustrated in the front half of the presentations. So here, this is the, the global circulation of the Argentinian artist. We see that the greatest contrast between the generation of artists in these cases is Ar Argentinian. While the circulatory trajectory of the older generations born before 1950 were heavily concentrated on between Western Europe and North and South America, but after 2015, we see a younger generations that enjoy the global reach much easier on their careers. So in these cases, as you can see, they're much more focused on this kind of the triangular positions, and then they reach it out to the later, the other part of the world, but if you're actually looking at those younger generation, they're actually using all these different paths that were already open by those older generations. So once people like the, you know, uh, the Guillermo Kika or the uh, Jose Maki became known, later generation benefited from this connection they and other had established. So there is now a respectable group of young artists whose work certainly internationally without them having left Argentina. So in short, most Argentinians stay at home. They become therefore even more dependent upon the vernacularizations and labeling to become known abroad. So in contrast, the scope of the circulation of the works by Lebanese and Korean artists did not change as much between younger generation versus the older generations. As you can see here for this Lebanese artist or for this Korean artist. However, the trajectory of the circulation merely, uh, so not however yet. So as you can see that the trajectory of the circulations merely thicken as the recognition of the older artists to continue to grow. And then uh, many leaves the countries searching for the stability they need to produce work and build their careers. So in this case of the Lebanon's work by the middle group of the artists circulated extensively. This is a precisely matching with what we highlighted, but the group that the vernacularizer, Catherine Davis and Freddie Leeson's originally promoted. So the role of the vernacularizer is definitely impacting on the circulation of the Lebanese, and then of course, the different generation of the group here. And for the Korean cases, Korea has a strong cultural infrastructure at home and abroad, as already mentioned by the Peggy. There is a generous public and private sectors for the cultural productions in Korea. And there is some kind of a very strong support from the government. So as you can see, it is very much stable. And even the older generation already enjoy those global representations uh, at the relatively earlier than the other cases. So this is kind of the general overview of this Argentinian, Lebanon, and South Korea. But actually, I wanted to highlight a little bit more about the story here. Even though we see more of the contrast between the Argentinians, but relatively less for the South Koreans or Lebanese, these different paths toward the decentering also become clearer when we are actually examining the changes in the new countries 
where our case work get displayed. These are the additional number of the countries where our case are featured in global distribution over time. So it means, yes, uh, in general, the circulation of the works by the older generation of artists took a way longer to be viewed in a greater number of the countries, despite the fact that actually they enjoyed a way more prominence and higher reputations than their younger, uh, younger generations. In contrast, as you can see, the younger artists show their work in a wider range of the locations at the earlier stage of their careers. So Argentinian older generation took a quite old to get additional locations in their careers, while the younger generation is starting to have more and more location added in their careers. And it is actually the same for the Argentinians and South Korea. For Lebanese cases, it's a little bit different from Argentinians or South Korean cases because uh, the Lebanon because of the destinations where their work is shown is we concentrate on the period after 2000 because the Lebanese actually has a little bit of like a push factors that they're actually pushing those artists out of their country due to those like a war or other political situations. So finally, so we investigated the change in how artists are labeled by creating the words cloud of their lifelong exhibition title. So we first created the natural language processing word count by grant using this different group exhibition title. So in these findings, we found that the wild art produced by the Koreans tends to be categorized as a more like a Korean here, geographically, or the contemporary aesthetic. Argentinians and Lebanese art are often included with a larger ethnic identities or geographic based identity such as Latin American art or Middle Eastern art, including contemporary art representations and Latinx. This is a pretty well matched how they were actually represented by those vernacularizers at earlier stage compared to the, those Korean cases. They were actually uh, elaborated and represented more as a Korean at a later stage. So in this figure is actually showing that, that the words cloud that we just show uh, in different countries across different generations. While the older, for example, let's start with the Argentinians. While the older generation of Argentinian artists were mostly grouped, uh, grouped and labeled as Latin American artists, the younger generation started to be called more of Argentinian or the narrower identities, Argentina or Buenos Aires as we emphasized and explained it before. And for the older group of the Lebanese artists, we see almost no geographic or identity label. It is actually matched with those like, a, you know, the middle group that were actually elaborated more by the vernacularizer. They actually started to see this contemporary Arab as predominance of the ideologies and identity label. And then it continued to survive in the younger generation too. And for the Korean cases, as you may, uh, as we already highlighted, the Koreanness actually appears in a younger generations, while the older and middle generations does not actually have much of those regional identities, but rather they focus more on aesthetical identities. So by showing these changes in global exhibition networks and labels, we try to demonstrate the role of the vernacularizers and labeling is a robust in both qualitative finding in our larger sample. Uh, so it, it is actually showing how the decentering of the cultural globalizations actually works over time and across different group of the artists. I tried to hand over to the conclusions to the panel as well. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So just to sum up briefly and then open up for discussion. Uh, scholarly interest in cultural globalization is on the rise as the neoliberalization and marketization of the artistic, literary, and music worlds increases in conjunction with our heightened global connectedness through technology and market expansion. But to date, much of this scholarship still treats cultural globalization as a tug of war between an admittedly more diverse group of centers and peripheries. It focuses on how norms are diffused and reinforced 
and on variations in how circulating norms and practices are adopted. In this picture, peripheral cultural locals are assumed to be receivers of central norms rather than producers and disseminators of norms in their own right. We build on this work, but also extend it by empirically studying how cultural global decentering works through three factors, artist physical migration, the intervention of vernacularizers, and through labeling. Using mixed methods, we track the proliferation of alternative, decentered alternative routes and how these new destinations increase and broaden over time. It is true that many members of the early generation of contemporary artists, such as Namjoon Pike or Guillermo Quitka or Paul Gagosian, left their countries of origin voluntarily or by force in order to gain international competition. We find, however, that once these circulatory pathways are established, physical movement is not a prerequisite. Um, For, for, for traversing them, sorry. Instead, the role of vernacularization and labeling becomes more important for the circulation of work and its broadening to a more diverse set of destinations over time. Artists' physical migration coupled with vernacularization during an earlier period is critical, but it becomes less important as the circulatory path, as circulatory pathways grow more established and when labeling catalyzes the circulation of artworks more than where the artist is actually working from. In each of our country cases, there are a few key individuals working from in and outside the country who communicate and make legible the exigencies of the world outside the nation to those who aspire to have their work exhibited and collected there. We identify two types of vernacularizers. The first belong to the transnational class of curators and gallerists and museum professionals who live and work around the world. The second are co-ethnics living in the diaspora. And these vernacularizers help educate and socialize new audiences throughout the global North and South about art and cultural produced in previously unknown reason, regions. They do this often through labeling, using identity, geographic, aesthetic, and ideological markers that set this work apart and make it visible in new ways, both enabling and constraining further circulation. Um, both groups play a critical role in making artists and their work visible, understandable, and valuable. But we find that they do some from somewhat different positions and with different goals in mind. The vernacular who's not part of the national di diaspora generally doesn't have a nationalistic agenda vis-a-vis -vis cultural globalization. They may enjoy greater autonomy. Um, but they don't have access to the resources dedicated to cultural promotion and export <clears throat> that national governments like Korea provide. In contrast, co-ethnic vernacularizers are sometimes willingly enlisted and sometimes co-opted into the national project. They benefit from additional resources, but they're constrained in their artistic and, cult and curatorial choices by funders' goals. Our research contributes to debates on cultural globalization in several important ways. First, we join scholars who move beyond the study of the globalization culture of culture to study cultural globalization hermeneutically, encompassing not just the movement of cultural objects, but how their movement is influenced by the landscape of meaning that forms those entities that force social life forward. We show empirically using quantitative and qualitative methods how decentering of the global cultural field unfolds over time and across regions. The, the accounts our respondents offer at of the role of vernacularization and labeling is strongly reflected in our quantitative analyses and in the decentering of the global cultural field we observe over time. We don't mean to suggest that all of the artists in our sample have shifted their sites away from traditional centers of power. Some of them still really want to get to London or New York. We do argue, however, that a significant number are creating alternative pathways and institutions that lead to new destinations in a more decentered cultural landscape. They include things like the Sharjah and Guangzhou Biennial in Korea, uh, the Quitka Fellowship, uh, which is a fellowship that one of the most prominent artists from Argentina set up to train the next generation of artists, 
and organizations like Ashkala Wan and the Arab Image Foundation. It remains to be seen, though, whether these efforts add up to a new sustainable vision of cultural production and dissemination, and that even if they do, they'll be able to stand firm against the ever more powerful presence of economic values in the art market. So thank, thank you, you very much. much. It was uh, full of information, full of questions. I imagine that our audience want to intervene, given that they are experts in the field. Uh, I leave the flow to them first. Okay, I start with a small comment. I would like uh, um, that you explain better the choice of these two, three a case study, Argentina, Lebanon, and uh, Korea, because of, um, since what I understand, but being economists are very rough in this, um, uh, culture is the main uh, barrier that you have to overcome uh, to be understood and known, appreciated in another in another market among people which, which are who are used to a different type of uh, culture but these three cases are very different in many reasons so for instance let us say the size of the population when you compare the lebanon the argentina and korea you consider a size of the population which is completely different. Lebanon is a small country with thousands of people abroad, especially the population is very highly educated. As you know, in Lebanon, we have the American University of Beirut, San Joseph University is, uh, I would say, a, a, a place where there is more education than jobs. And that reason why people move. And also the income per capita. So uh, I would uh, I would imagine that uh, the Lebanese diaspora for sure is playing an infrared role. We all know many Lebanese. In every city, there are Lebanese in Europe, in the United States, which are not different from the native fundamentally. They are also Lebanese, but they are well integrated in the economy. They are and so on. The Argentina instead is a completely different country with much lower income per capita, with the law, law, law distinction between poor people and high level uh, income people, and also education. So these three, these three, three cases are so different that is, that is difficult for me. But the Argentina, however, they have a strong link with Europe because many of them were European migrants, so they have a diaspora on both sides of the ocean. So it's difficult for me to, while if you consider an African artist, I would say coming from South Sudan, also, I would understand that there is a, a cultural limitation. So I would like that you explain a little bit more the choice and why this choice, you consider this choice, uh, um, right. I don't know if you want to collect the, the question because there is also Bert, uh, that Bert that has raised the hand and want to intervene. Okay, sure. Sure. Bert? Bert, the floor is yours. Bert. Okay. So I just, I just want to, I want to start by thanking uh, both of you for a really interesting and excellent um, uh, presentation for, you know, a really rich uh, material here. And I'm, 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 I'm curious about, um, I mean, I really, really um, appreciate the effort that you're making in, in sort of the effort of decolonization, uh, theoretical decolonization here, the vernacularization of uh, what in the global centers is considered the periphery and a kind of a transformation of, of the picture that we uh, very often get uh, of globalization, especially in these matters. Um, um, I'm also, I've also been studying uh, artistic projects over, uh, over a couple of years now. Um, and when I look at it uh, from an empirical point of view, I think that the, the greatest moment of gatekeeping uh, is not in the actual exhibition or in the meeting of the audience, but in, in the funding. Um, I, see, I see really literally uh, no art that gets 
done without funding. And of course, I mean, if you're a successful artist and you can sort of survive on the capitalist art market, you might not be so susceptible to it. But my research suggests that you are nevertheless, because um, the funding agencies who, you know, who give out funds for art are also gatekeepers of uh, prestigious awards of, of uh, you know, uh, they're gatekeepers of the prestige of the of the art scene. So, in fact, even if you are a very successful artist, you're still sort of uh, subjected to the regime of of the funding structures. And, and these funding structures, um, when I have studied them, I see no signs of vernacularization in them. In fact, I see I, I, the funding structures and the schemes that they promote and the ways that they uh, establish themselves are products of, of, uh, of very central political organizations, organizations like UNESCO, the UN, um, the focused on the creative economy uh, very recently is a very good example of that. And I think that there's like quite a lot of really good research. Sarah Brulette's book, recent book about UNESCO and the fate of the literary is a very good example of this. So while I, I, can, I can recognize this sort of ambition to, to to trace how artists from the peripheries are making it into the center and perhaps creating their own new centers. I, I still kind of lack the uh, the dimension of the funding that I think hovers above this whole you know this this map of how people move. And this hovering above um uh it I, I can't see any signs in that for, um, for um, uh, you know, decolonizing itself. I mean, Sarah Brulette uh, is arguing that it's losing power. Uh, so UNESCO is kind of losing power. Uh, Chinese interests are also moving into UNESCO. So Chinese funding and, and, and uh, uh, to the Chinese government's um, express demands on UNESCO projects are also being heard right now. Overall, UNESCO is kind of losing potency, um, but that has to do with uh, the sort of uh, uh, the deterioration of two of the pillars of UNESCO, education globally and democracy globally. So if education and democracy dwindles down, of course, UNESCO is also going to have a hard time maintaining its, uh, its status as a gatekeeper in cultural matters. So uh, I was just wondering, have you considered, you know, looking for the money in this? Also, thank you very much, uh, Bernard. Enrico Bertacchini has raised his hand. I think that there was first a Tiziana. Ah, sorry. Yeah. No problem. Thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to see you, um, Peggy. And thanks for the presentation. Also, uh, to uh, Kang, Kang San was very interesting. And yeah, my point actually I think follows very well on the previous one. Uh, and it, much, it is much more a uh, curiosity because I'm not an expert on uh, artist uh, production. But uh, I think that uh, Kang, Kang San mentioned some policy of uh, South Korea supporting uh, um, artist networks. So I was very curious to understand if in your data you can somehow tease out the impact of uh, national policies as well and these policies that might be supporting or or not maybe also boycotting uh, some artists uh, rather than others. That's it. And sorry if I have at some point to disconnect, but I have another webinar today. So it's full webinar afternoon. Thanks a lot again. Uh, Enrico? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Peggy and uh, Kangsan, for the, the very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Also, I have just to add uh, uh, two comments or questions, very short. Uh, the first one is that uh, I, I was fascinated to see well all the the uh, effects that the young generations are of course getting more um, exhibition and co-exhibition in different location and I do really appreciate it, the the analysis where you are uh, 
you are underlining the fact that uh, uh, there is no more necessity of uh, full migration of artists, but young generation uh, in, in, indeed, or in the new period, there is a more, uh, let's say, spot mobility. Uh, uh, Hypermobility, it's recognized as a, as a, a new trend in artistic careers. Uh, I would like to know, understand a bit more if you see this more as an effect or as a cause of this uh, vernacularization at the global level. Um, this is uh, uh, the first point. And secondly, connected to, to, to uh, Tiziana, I, I think that uh, um, I, I work with, with the UNESCO uh, data set as well. Uh, and I think that there, is, um, um, there, is, there could be, be something interesting to explore. Also, there is a good database uh, on uh, policies and strategies by country uh, provided in the UNESCO Convention for uh, Cultural Diversity. Uh, where artistic mobility is one of the most important, well, one of the uh, domains uh, of the of the convention would be also interesting to explore the uh, the countries that provide artistic visas and so on in order to to frame this uh, diplomacy of the uh, um, of the artistic exchange and maybe put it in connection with your uh, with your data. Thank you, uh, Roberta Mizuraka. And Vibke, Lass. I'm here. Can you help me? Because I have a problem today with my no, here. Okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you so much for this interesting uh, discussion. So, my question is very similar to that of Professor uh, Venturini. So, uh, I am uh, an economist. And so sorry if my question may seem uh, very uh, trivial. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, should not con you consider the uh, development uh, condition of the artist uh, receiving and uh, departure country, not only in uh, absolute terms, but also uh, variation uh, over time, uh, for instance, uh, uh, political crisis, uh, because uh, I think that uh, there is uh, a lot of um, uh, there are uh, there are uh, a lot uh, uh, of uh, missed uh, variable in your study, uh, for instance, uh, economic or social factor that you uh, do not consider. Thank you. Vipke. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I can't switch on my camera because my uh, my link is not very good. So I hope you can hear me. I yes, hear sure. You. Thank you very Thank much you. for a very wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> I wonder whether you can say a bit more about the links between the three cases because you showed us the pathways per case. But I would be interested in finding out whether, you know, somebody from Argentina becoming an important artist also helps somebody from Korea to grow, uh, become a global artist. Does that, that, do we find any links there? And the second thing I found interesting was that you, you mentioned for Latin America that they were first labeled as Latin American and only later were labeled at, as artists predominantly. Whereas for the other two cases, you had, you know, the artist label first and then only afterwards the identity label. And I wonder whether you have any explanation for that. What, why is it there such a difference between the two? Thank you. Uh, I think there is Viola Zanzirolami. The background of the intervention is very different. Viola is a professor of uh, chores, music, dance and so on. Yeah, uh, hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for for the presentation, Kansan and Peggy. Uh, I have my question is probably mm, too simple mm, compared to to the level of the other questions, but I, I'm very curious about this. I've been I've been working in uh, um, I, in my life. I met uh, some people from the business uh, from the show business around the world, uh, and um, and I have this example of a, a guy from Ethiopia. Um, and a guy from Palestine, from Palestine. So they were uh, um, uh, a singer. By the way, he was killed uh, in the in the recent uh, in in a riot uh, in one year ago. But he was one of the representatives of of, uh, of a movement uh, um, from Romia in Ethiopia. And the other one is an actor from Palestine. And both of them 
um, uh, were or are touring the world uh, connected to the diaspora people from their countries, right? So the Palestinians uh, and, and the Ethiopians. And um, talking to them, I realized that in, in both these cases, they were, um, they were reaching their own culture audiences. For example, United States, in Canada, around the world, they were going to perform for Ethiopians or for Palestinians or, and so on. So I was wondering if, and maybe you, you gave already an answer about this, but maybe I got distracted. I, I hope I, I didn't miss this point. I, I was wondering if in, in the art uh, business, there's a similar phenomenon. I mean, if there's a reception, an audience, a specific audience that follows these people uh, according to um, the, the similar culture they have. For example, if there's an artist from Argentina, Argentina coming to, to Italy and you get many Argentinians going and visiting the exhibition. Thank you. Okay, the last one, Carolina, Tatiana, with you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a fascinating presentation. I really enjoyed it. So thank you to you all for organizing as well. Uh, I was just wondering about cultural institutions and what the role is of institutions in um, the pathways that artists uh, create uh, to well, to uh, achieve success in the in the in the cultural world. And particularly related, I guess, um, to a comment earlier on funding, how uh, cultural institutions also play that gatekeeping role of access, of allowing or enabling access uh, to funding in those um, cores or centers of uh, contemporary art world, particularly when we're talking about visual art. Um, there are a strong emphasis, I guess, put on the role that um, national galleries or, or national institutions play in all this. So I was curious to find out more about this. Thank you. Peggy, you have a lot of time, I imagine, to answer all these questions. <laughs> Please go okay. ahead, select the what you <laughs> select the one that you consider more important. Well, they're all important and they're all giving us things to think about. And I we I think I can speak for Kang saying that we really appreciate them and and the opportunity to share this work with you. And I guess I would say that um you know all of you talked about barriers, funding in particular, national differences, institutions. We are very cognizant of the fact that those things are there. And so in a way, what we're doing is looking for openings from the ground up, like, you know, that there are these people who are trying and institutions that are trying to chart these alternative pathways and they're doing it. But as I finished, as I said in the conclusion, um, you know, will they be able to stay alternative or are they going to be eaten up or 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 wilt away because of the forces of the market so we're you know that is kind of the starting point for this so what how can decentering actually um take place within this larger context that totally works against it in so many ways and that in a way is my answer to the question about the cases, because we start from the finding that these three countries have artists and writers who are um, who are visible in the global art world. And we didn't wanna do superstar countries like China or India, because they seem to us as in a class of their own. So you saw the, the, the um, the figures that show that as of 2000, there's this rise of entry of artists from these three countries. And I don't think they're as different as you make them out to be, or that the size of the population is the thing that matters, because actually people are very educated in all of those countries, and they all have this experience of war and violence and political instability. They all have very interesting public private partnerships that are intervening in the art world and they're using art and culture to deal with their um, their uh, burdened histories 
And so what we're trying to do is see, you know, we wanted to see how do countries from different regions and at different times infiltrate the global art world. So we wanted to look across time and across region. Um, and, and so that was the, that was, that is the, um, uh, some of the reasoning for choosing the cases. I don't think the, um, yeah, I'll just stop with that. Um, and the funding, you're absolutely right. The funding is, is key and that Korea has such an advantage because the state policies are so much behind, um, promoting. Korean culture as an export, that it's just part of a master plan of sort of raising the country um, totally. Um, but vernacularizers influence funding too, because some of these people are in positions where they, you know, get money for exhibitions or they get money to do scholarship or they get money to do conferences. And so there is a way that, that um, people are People can intervene. The diaspora and that that transnational class can intervene. Um, uh, okay, I um, I don't know how to answer the question about cultural institutions or funding more generally because those are just such big factors, and um, I don't know how to kind of um, I don't know how to break that down enough to answer it in a meaningful way um, in a in a in a quick answer. Um, when Vipka's question about the, the pathways between countries, um, we found few of them. And I've also found that um, uh, in the literary world that there's not much circulation of materials from between these global south countries. But that is part of the idea, like in each of the countries that we're studying, there's a, I would say that there's a group of people who still want, who still have their sights set on um, the, the, you know, tradition arriving at the traditional centers of power. And then there is a group of people who see what they're doing as a decolonizing project and are trying to, to create alternative platforms and alternative institutions that um, that can circumvent these circ circumvent these um, circuits of power and and redefine what success means. And so it means, for example, in a literary case, um, you know, small publishers who don't want their books to have to go through Madrid and Barcelona to get from Argentina to Mexico. So this is a post-colonial project that isn't trying to be Penguin Random House, you know, or Planeta, these big conglomerates. They're accepting kind of, their their sites are lower in terms of financial gain and also scope, but, they, but the point is to kind of take the power back from Spain and be able to, to, to um, create a viable market and paths of circulation within Latin America. So I don't know what else you want to add, Kang Sang. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there were so many interesting questions, and I was actually happy to hear about money talks. So yeah. I mainly study about art markets, and then money talk is kind of my topic too. So uh, yes, funding matters, and money matters for sure. And those art centers, like China or like New York or London, is a pretty heavily driven by those monies, especially the big money. I understand that. I think it is still, that's the reason why we are actually paying attention to these three countries rather than focusing on those Chinese cases or those Americans or European cases. But at the same time, I wanted to highlight it. These three group of the artists are actually still very famous ones. So I have to admit it that we are actually decide to choose those most famous and well-recognized artistic group from these three national countries. And I know, I understand this is a convenient sample, if you can call it as a, a quantitative way. But at the same time, uh, these are like the most famous and well-recognized by those art critics and then curators of nowadays. In the last 10 years, 
These are a group of national artists who actually receive pretty much attention from the global art world. So except those Chinese art boom, and then except those like African art boom in those early 2000s. So these are like a three major group of the artists who actually received the attention in the last decades or the 20 years. That's why, as you probably could see in our chart and in our data, the group vision increased and it actually matches pretty well about how often they actually got sold. Their sales is also pretty much matched with the exhibition record. So yes, they are pretty much famous enough. And then they are the one who actually received much attention from the global art market and plus the global art world. So that was the reason that uh, why we actually decided to focus on make some uh, comparisons across these three countries. Even though, yes, they are very much uh, sociopolitically have a different passage to develop their art careers and art, uh, also the career of the artist. And again, going back to those like um, money issues, yes, the institution better, yes. And that's probably the reason why we highlighted that in Korean cases, we see more of the institutional support, while Lebanon, they didn't have much of that. That's why they actually pushed those artists away from their domestic markets first. And then they are actually inviting back once they actually have those institutional support later on when the artists already received their attention from the global market. So yes, there are very much interesting story about the institutional support and those things. And we try to put them in our story in a qualitative study. But in general, we just wanted to show even uh, we pay lesser attention about those institutional political turbulence across the years. We can actually see how how large their you know, the, the, the circulation, how how large their circulation or expansions can actually happen across different years, and also those younger generation can actually reach out to those locations that probably the older generation even couldn't imagine to do so even though they are probably way more famous than those younger generation artists. And I believe another thing is, I don't think that the Lebanese or Argentinians and Koreans are actually following their national artists across the other global reasons, unlike those BTS fan armies or the other like the, the music fandom. So, that's actually probably one of the good reasons to actually focus on these three cases. Because a China, for example, like a Chinese artist, those people who are actually buy, buying Chinese art in New York is a Chinese. Those people, uh, those are like a Chinese art who are actually consumed in Paris are mostly Chinese. So we cannot really say this, that the Chinese artwork is actually sold or exhibited in those regions, different location is actually impact of this global reception of these artists in different regions or just expansion of the Chinese community. But at least in our cases for Lebanese and Argentinian Korean cases, we probably can uh, think about lesser, I mean, I mean, lesser worried about this type of the global expansions based on the economic loss of their national uh, monies or the community. So. Uh, diaspora is actually functioning in a way to make them more interpretative or well received in a certain area, especially in those centers. But I don't think that is actually heavily impacting on expansions of those multiple locations, as we probably worry, uh, as, as we probably can worry. And among the, yeah, I think. I think that's pretty much it. And if I miss some of the questions, yeah, I'm sorry that you can probably remind me. Thank you very much. I saw a hand with Ber Bernard briefly raised before. I don't know if you want to have some other comment. No, no, not really. I, I was. Um... I was okay. thinking that that the uh, answer was uh, more than satisfied. <laughs> so Peggy, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for all the participants. We we look forward to read your paper. 
as soon as you have a rough uh, version, we'll be delighted to read a comment. Thank you very much for this premiere, I would say. No? Mm, thank you for the invitation and thanks for the great questions and nice to see old friends and meet some new ones. So really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much. We hope to see in person sooner or later, one of these days, but for the moment, this is sufficient to overcome the distance. Okay. okay. Bye. Thank Ciao you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.